I haven't heard. Okay. Frozen. All right. Okay, so good evening, everyone. I'd like to get us started on um, our curriculum committee this evening. And I don't know, Mr. McDaniels, if you have any opening comments or anything. I'll just say that we have received an informational summary of the meeting on May 17th. Um, and uh, there is an archive video uh, recording that serves as the committee's official meeting minutes. And uh, they're available on the Board of Education's website. And if there's any discrepancy between the video and informational summary, the uh, official minutes will prevail. So with that, we all accept the information and uh, turn it back over to you. Okay, thank you so much. So our first item um, this evening on new business is approval of our 2018-2019 calendar for the curriculum committee. And um, members, you have that um, proposed uh, schedule in front of you. I'd just like to uh, note that um, we did not schedule one in December, uh, given that there will be a new board um, coming into place and that they'll have many things that they're working through in the month of December. So other than that, the proposal follows what our normal schedule is. And that seems reasonable because, again, they'll probably need a couple weeks to get organized and assign committee members and things like that. I would just ask uh, uh, Ms. Eaton and uh, Mr. Young if they have any thoughts or comments about the schedule. No. If not, we'll accept and approve um, the schedule as presented. Okay, thank you. And then moving on to our next uh, agenda item, I'd like to invite Mr. Imbriella and Mr. Corns forward uh, to share with you this evening a presentation on maker learning. So maker learning is really a, a, an exciting um, experience for our students. It, it is a interdisciplinary approach to uh, creativity, communication, design process uh, that is really taking off in our schools through a wide array of opportunities uh, that are being created um, at different levels and different schools. So on that, I'll turn it over to <laughs> our team here who will share with you and do some demonstrations of materials that our children use. So hi, good afternoon, everyone. We're, uh, we're really, uh, Jim and I are really excited to be here to talk about BCP, BCPS Makes and the work uh, that we've done across the system working with uh, multiple offices, especially with our academic offices and our, um, our schools to really grow this whole concept of maker lear learning and the work that's happening in our schools. Um, you know, we, when you think about tinkering and building and creating, uh, we have these rich programs at our high school level, at our high school level, connected to career and technology education. And it's really about pushing that down as far as we can into um, even our pre-K programs. And so we're really excited to be here to talk about uh, that program. So uh, maker learning is, is as um, uh, Dr. Uh, Boswell said, grounded in strong educational theory and uh, pedagogy. And what's exciting about it is it's a genuinely authentic way mm -hmm. uh, to make connections across subject areas and allow students to create, design, build, um, and like I had mentioned before, uh, tinker. It, it also directly connects to um, our um, 21st century skills, media literacy, uh, the concept of information literacy, uh, and technology literacy. And you'll see some of that as we talk about some of the, some of the things that we have uh, displayed here because we, bought, we brought some things to tinker with. Mm -hmm. uh, so um, as I mentioned, uh, uh, sorry, this, actually I was on this slide while I was talking, so I'm gonna leave this up here for a second because I didn't click forward, but really it's about constructivism uh, and uh, the opportunity to connect, connect the ideas around uh, STEAM, so science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, and push that concept down uh, connected to the arts. So um, when we think about making, um, a lot of times it can be uh, narrowly thought of and we can think only about um, the use of a, a computer or technology. And uh, making, in our minds, is a much broader concept than that. It's everything from uh, creating with cardboard to uh, 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 audiovisual, so connecting that to our music programs that we have in our elementary, middle schools, and high schools, 
to everything from textile, uh, literally using sewing machines. So it's all of those different concepts built into the work around making. <clears throat> So now, now we're going to make something, and we've we, <laughs> we've we've modeled up, and this is an an actual activity we do with second graders. And so, just to explain the parts we have here, we have a laptop that's running uh, a program called Scratch, which is written by MIT. It's free for us to use, and it's a programming uh, framework that students access online, utilized in many many of our schools. Um, we have a device that's called a Makey Makey. <laughs> um, and it, it's what it's called. And um, uh, this this device uh, mimics uh, a keyboard, so it's plugged into the to the laptop as a USB uh, uh, device, and it mimics the up, down, left, and right arrows. And then we have um, Play-Doh. Okay. <laughs> so this this activity, the students write the Scratch program. In second grade, in se so they, in the, they, they write really that program. Do, yeah, they really do this. They they create the the uh, program online, and one of the activities in here that you'll hear in a second is there is audio where the students record aspects of, in this case, geometric shapes. So they do the research about what the shape uh, involves, and they do the recording. Now my staff did the recordings for us, so um, they'll sound like adults. <laughs> um, then. This, this setup is designed so that a student would then come along, a second student, and engage in this explore, exploration of the program that the first student is basically providing a virtual learning opportunity for the, for the kids. So, uh, Mr. Young, did you, wanna, did you wanna touch this stuff? You can. Okay, so, so we're going to have my, my volunteer second grader. Um, so what Ryan's going to do is he's going to grab a hold of the green lead, uh, which is the ground. Make sure you touch the metal. Okay. Got it. And then he's going to touch a shape. So you have to imagine um, second graders, uh, probably in pairs or triads, have have written this program and then created this using the Makey Makey. And then another group of second graders in the same class uh, are, are moving around the room um, in small groups, going through a series of potential activities where all the different groups of students have created something for the other students to learn from. And so this ties directly to the Maryland College and Career Ready Standards of uh, the second grade geometry 2GA1, which is to uh, draw shapes that have specific attributes and a given number of angles and a given number of equ uh, equal faces and identify triangles, quadrilaterals, pentagons, hexagons, and cubes. And what's really exciting is we just took that, which is not much fun for Jim to read, and brought it to life. So that, that is the entire purpose around this activity, uh, is to engage students in both coding and computational thinking as well as shape recognition. So to really bring that home in a tactile, mm -hmm. in a tactile sense. What's the Play-Doh part? So the Play-Doh part, the, these are the shapes that they're to identify. So I have a square and a, and a hexagon and a pentagon and a triangle. And they are acting as the connection. So when I touch the shape, it will, it will tell me about the shape that I've touched. So the students are also learning a little bit about electrical currents. Mm -hmm. Right. And how that process works. Yep. And in an electrical sense, the green is always ground, which is a, a good life lesson to know <laughs> if you have a home ownership. So the, this idea is to give them an activity that allows them to both utilize this device to program for as well as a concrete rooted activity for a learning outcome that would be, in this case, mathematics. Just think, if you're smart enough to program that, <laughs> So this is, this is a, a practical application that can be expanded upon. This is just a, a, an example. We, decide, we, we look for about a three minute activity because at first we thought maybe we could engage everybody in, in making something, but in this format it, it would have been a little awkward. So this actually introduces the kids to the use of a Makey Makey, which basically is building a controller for their game. So they can utilize almost any kind of um, 
end to these these uh, leads to create a a controller. So it, it, while it may look like a low level activity, this is an introductory process to both coding, using an external controller, and building the actual interface. Go ahead, you have questions, yes. <laughs> I could see you have a question. <laughs> Well, I, I, I was still having a hard time when the students come in the class who are going to program the, what steps they, you know, with the makey makey, um, did they have original thoughts in their mind that they communicate to the program and give the feedback that's going to go to the next group? Or, or could you just walk me through when the, the, the kids that are given the instruction, how, how do they start out? Sure. So the, the main creativity and with the, the initial scratch is that their program is designed around what their original thought would be. Okay. How, how, do I, how do I want my information to be presented? Okay. Okay, so I, my, as, again, my staff chose a very basic, they have a square here. Mm -hmm. They recorded a very basic script with it, but the scripting of that, the, the choice as to what appears on the screen as it is interacted with is all on the students, as well as the coding as to how the next piece comes up, or is there another step, or is there any on-screen activity that says to touch the next thing? Those are all their original thought. That's and, the design. And Scratch is block programming. So the whole concept of it drop. is very visual and drag and drop. So um, d to build the program um, is a very visual experience as well. Mm -hmm. That's correct. That is correct. Yep. So basically, it's hard coded based on um, the shape to its position on the making. Mm -hmm. Yep. So it does take a, a, a little bit of uh, troubleshooting to get through if you're getting the wrong input. And so uh, I think one of the most um, interesting things I've watched is. Uh, I was in one of our uh, STEAM magnet schools where coding is uh, a huge cornerstone of, of their activity, watching students uh, decompile each other's code to figure out where the bug is. Um, and it's amazing to watch their thought process, that logical process of where is, where is my program going wrong? And so, uh, Mr. Young, like you were saying, if, if I've got the wrong color to the wrong shape, I'm going to get the wrong output. Um, so. Absolutely, there's the, there is a troubleshooting aspect to this that, that would lead through to many other applications. Uh, again, making being the idea of construction that is tied to real world activities that is uh, in a building process. So while it looks like this may be a very simple process, the next step after this is more complex and more complex mm -hmm. so that you can scaffold the, the experience up to a, a full blown uh, actual programming process. Okay. How long have we been using this um, uh, BCPS makes and, and this particular approach? Uh, uh, this is, we're in our third year of the concept of BCPS makes. Mm -hmm. Making has been happening in our schools uh, Forever. I don't want to say forever, but right. essentially forever. Right. So the concept of making and designing and building um, has, has is, has always been there. Uh, I think what BCP, BCPS makes has allowed us to do is put a framework around it, and then um, it drives us to direct connect with our academic offices and, and offer the opportunity to really think about, here's our curriculum. Um, here's what's happening in, with this example, second grade. How can, we in, how can we continue to enhance that curriculum through activities that provide students the opportunity to, uh, to build, to create, to design across curricular areas? You're next. <laughs> well, just a wait time. Uh, so um, so as, as Ryan was mentioning, BCPS Makes is the official name for the, the maker movement that, that is happening in, in BCPS currently. Um, we have four areas that 
are encompassed within that. We have the Mobile Innovation Lab. We have uh, school maker learning support. We have uh, community maker spaces, and we have maker the maker kit lending program and each one of these we're going to delve into a little bit and they do address the p21 framework and 21st century skills so i'm going to talk a little bit about um maker learning by the numbers so uh, in 2016 and se uh, 17 the mobile innovation lab uh, which is our vehicle that travels around the county um, and uh, services for the most part our elementary schools uh, served roughly 6,000 students and then did an additional eight events uh, around the county. Uh, this past year, with uh, the year coming to a close tomorrow, we've completed 15 residency programs. We've served roughly about 10,000 students and we've attended uh, 10 events. Those include this year's Maker Fair uh, that came through elementary science and then we also did the BCPS Back to School Festival. Uh, when we talk about residencies, just to speak to that for, for a brief minute, that, that really is the Mobile Innovation Lab arriving at an elementary school and staying there for a week, spending an entire week there working with the teachers and the students in that building and offering them an experience to do things they otherwise might not be able to do in their school because of the equipment that's available on the Mobile Innovation Lab. Uh, but uh, we always tie what's happening on the Mobile Innovation Lab to where students are in their particular curriculum in their classrooms. To continue with numbers, um, more than 20 of our elementary schools have created what we call a fifth special that highlights maker learning. So it's an opportunity for students to go to um, a maker learning location in the building. Again, the activities are always tied back to what's happening in their, um, in their classrooms. Um, and that's been a, a, a really nice enhancement in certain buildings in order to help, the, uh, and help those teachers offer opportunities for students to create, design, and build that they might not otherwise have in their particular classroom. Also through, like I mentioned before, in elementary science, the Maker Fair was attended by over 1,100 students. Uh, that just occurred, Ms. Shea, that was just like a week May? and a half ago, wasn't yeah. it? Two weeks? Yeah. It was in May. The very end of um, And then uh, also, and this is an example of our 3D uh, opportunity, we had six of our elementary schools submitted uh, models uh, and written responses for our 3D printing challenge. Uh, this was the first time we did a 3D printing challenge. It was about designing a house. So uh, schools had to submit a project uh, where it described exactly what happened through the design process, the thinking process, the creation process, and then um, through the 3D printers that were provided for each of our elementary schools, they had to 3D print the house that was designed by the group of students. And these are examples of the houses uh, that were designed during the 3D printing challenge. Could you pass maybe one I or can. two of those? I got it. Let's sort of see them a little up close thank you So while, while you all are looking at our the, the 3D printed houses, mm -hmm. um, I'll talk a little bit about maker learning support. So when we talk about maker learning support, what we really mean here is the push in that we provide through professional development opportunities to all of our schools, uh, our elementary, that. middle, and high schools through direct support. It's in-school professional development where we're in the building providing support one-on-one -on -one with particular teachers who want to work on an activity. It's also um, opportunity for us to talk either web conferencing or, or via phone or email. Uh, and then we also do a lot of co-teaching and co-planning with our teachers. I'm going to give you guys a second to take a look at those too while you're looking. So as Jim talked about, there's, there's four quadrants that we think about when we talk about BCP, BCPS makes. I mentioned our residency program with the Mobile Innovation Lab. Uh, and uh, the Mobile Innovation Lab really, to go back and just frame it under two, two ideas, residencies for our elementary schools and um, school and community events. 
And uh, we've, as you can see, over the past two years had uh, close to 16,000 students through our elementary programs who have benefited from the Mobile Innovation Lab. Uh, I think it's important to note that the Mobile Inno Innovation Lab is ever changing. Mm -hmm. So the, the design of that vehicle was built so um, it has the capacity to change the kind of activities and tools that are inside that lab. So as uh, using Makey Makey as an example, um, if, if that tool uh, becomes readily available in all of our elementary schools, then that's not the kind of activity we would have on the Mobile Innovation Lab. We would be providing some sort of other activity on the Mobile Innovation Lab that allows students to participate in something they might not readily have in their building. A great example of that is uh, we have a whole suite of drones that we have on the Mo Mobile Innovation Lab that we use with our um, elementary students. So, <coughs> Following up with the idea of um, having uh, supplies that schools can use before they buy them, the, mo the Maker Kit Lending Program is designed around that idea of try it before you buy it. So uh, my office uh, provides out kits to schools upon request that have uh, class sets of things like Makey Makeys, things like Ozobots. Um, we've loaned out Lego uh, Mindstorm kits. Those go to the school so that they can participate in the activities before they expend any school funds on uh, making that a local project so the the lender library is designed to go out to buildings so that there can be a a test run of things and experience what these activities are before they have to engage in actual funding of that locally um, we have in in the Baltimore County area in, including several in in Baltimore City we have maker community partners uh, they are community maker spaces uh, we have local partnerships with the Digital Harbor Foundation open works and the foundry um, the we work with uh, the found the, with Digital Harbor Foundation, which is a youth maker space in Baltimore City, uh, to both uh, do professional development and also gain ideas of things to bring back to Baltimore County. Um, and we have uh, multiple interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary connections that we've worked through these partners to experience so that we can better our making environment. Uh, when it comes to open works as an sorry when it comes to open works as an example we have a memorandum memorandum of understanding with open works that allows our teachers to benefit from discounts discounted uh, workshops and professional development that might occur at open works on particular tools and resources let me just add, um, and I believe it's open works and uh, mr. Morelli you can correct me and perhaps the foundry um, this is a site where, um, just to kind of see where this concept of making goes uh, for people in terms of careers, um, this is these are places where um, inventors and entrepreneurs can go and create prototypes of their invention uh, and then have the resources to help sort of take it to market, if you will. So I know uh, Mr. Handy has worked with, I think, the CTE advisory group. They've taken kids on field trips to some of these places so that they can see the resources that are out there um, for you know, our budding inventors and the resources that they have uh, to support getting uh, their invention or their businesses off the ground. So the ne our next couple slides are around what we're doing at each level. So at, at the elementary school, uh, as we've already uh, spoken about, we have the Mobile Innovation Lab residencies, uh, which as we described, were a week residency where uh, the Mobile Innovation Lab comes to, to the building and interacts. Um, we also have um, the lending kits, and we've distributed 3D printers to each one of our elementary schools, uh, which you saw the result of the activity um, uh, that were, were passed in to, um, for, for evaluation, uh, those, uh, those printers are present in every elementary school, so they all have the same opportunity to those. Um, we have, um, as we spoke about, the fifth special being created in, in about 20 of our schools uh, so that there is a place in the building for maker, making to occur. Um, and then we are looking to uh, build a framework next that will give maker uh, the maker movement some uh, guidelines so that individuals can engage in uh, similar activities in each elementary school uh, to build a curriculum uh, that or curricular 
components that would plug in and allow for a maker to be part of our curricular activity. Um, and that would work into the fifth special as well. So at the, at the secondary level, obviously we want to tie this to our CTE programs uh, and, and make sure there's that continuation of collaboration that we have with our academic subjects. We are also providing middle school starter maker kits, uh, which is something that we haven't provided um, up to this point. We're going to continue to field test some opportunities where the Mobile Innovation Lab might be able to spend some extended times at some of our middle schools. Uh, currently, the Mobile Innovation Lab has focused its time at our elementary schools. Um, and then, um, we're gonna think about our um, high schools as well and work with CTE on starter maker learning kits at the high school level and then uh, continue to think about expanding and adapting the program with the mobile innovation lab. Uh, there's a lot of interest in the lab at the elementary level, so at the same time that we wanna expand um, its services, we um, wanna be cognizant that we wanna be able to serve as many elementary schools as possible through the mobile innovation lab. Uh, and then really when we look at K-12 as a whole, um, you can see that there's now this constant presence uh, district-wide. There are numerous professional learning opportunities for our teachers. Uh, we do a lot of work through our um, STAT, our monthly STAT teacher institute that's held. Um, and then our blended learning institutes, which will occur uh, actually next week on uh, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. There are a number of different sessions for our teachers to attend around the concept of making. Uh, and then next year, continuing to expand the idea of um, lesson expansion. So one of the things, as Jim mentioned, that we want to do is ensure that it, um, at every opportunity um, our teachers find that natural fit for um, making built into the curriculum and there's examples where that can happen. So we're really excited about our maker learning program here in Baltimore County and uh, it, it had certainly expanded over the last few years. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Um, I did want to ask, you mentioned the community events. I think you said there were 15 or 16. Can you describe some of what that they, they were, these community events that you participated in? And what, give me an example of. Sure, so we've done, um, uh, we've done events wor working with the Baltimore County Public Library, for example, where the Mobile Innovation Lab has gone out to like an evening library event. Okay. Uh, we've uh, done specific events at some of our secondary schools who wouldn't get it for the residency. Okay. Uh, where we've gone to, um, I'll use an example of like, uh, they might have a STEM night right. or a okay. STEAM night. Uh, mm -hmm. where we go out and the Mobile Innovation Lab is there for them to participate. We've also done events uh, at a statewide and a national level as well. So the Mobile Innovation Lab has traveled to Washington, D.C. for the National Maker Fair, um, and the Mobile Innovation Lab has participated in, in events for the Maryland State Department of Education as well. So do you solicit these community events, or do they know, or some... We have, um, for each semester of the school year, there's a registration process where schools and um, organizations can request the Mobile Innovation Lab to participate, and then uh, the team looks at the calendar and tries to ensure that um, we're providing equitable service across the system, and then also uh, meeting whatever needs might be there statewide or in the county to support other, uh, um, other offices or government agencies. Okay, thank you. I'll just add one last thing. I don't. I don't know if um, if you've had the opportunity to visit Eastern High School uh, again, just to sort of see how this threads through and how it it um, evolves and uh, in terms of opportunity and sophistication. If you get a chance to see the Maker Lab at Eastern High School, Eastern Tech Nickel High mm -hmm. School, I guess it is. Uh, they have converted. Um, a bay that had been, I think, a diesel program at some point, an automotive program. I see Mr. Handy. It was definitely it. an automotive it program. It was an of some automotive sort of program effect, of yeah. some kind that at some point in the past that program um, faded out of, the, of that school's offerings. Um, and so they've revamped those resources and they take kids in there as part of their capstone design process. Um, so again, this, this idea evolves over time for children so that they become um, inventive problem solvers for real world context. So, okay, thank you. Thank, thank you. you. And so while they are clean up the play right, <laughs> cleaning up our Mickey makes, uh, 
Mr. Imbrelli is um, back with us with the robotics components and software. Oh, I'm sorry, I jumped ahead, forgive me. <laughs> um, we're, I'm gonna invite Dr. Wistead and Mr. Wimbley to come forward and share with us uh, the mentoring program. Forgive me, I looked down, too far down on my agenda. <laughs> So as you know, we have been, um, literacy and climate have been our key focus this year and will continue um, into next school year. And so one of the many proactive pieces to supporting school climate and supporting our students um, is one of the pieces is our mentoring program. And our mentoring program is robust and is multifaceted. Uh, and Mr. Wimbley and Dr. Wistet will share with you some of the nuances of our opportunities for students. Uh, good evening. First of all, thank you very much for this time. I'm very happy to be able to share some of the work that's been involved with our mentoring. Uh, my name is Marcus Wimberly, and I proudly serve as the mentor facilitator for Baltimore County. Um, just to start, what I'd like to do is to first define what the term mentoring is and what it will mean for the rest of the presentation. And it's this mentoring is relationship-based support taking place between youth and older, more experienced persons with the goal of mentoring is to help the mentees in the areas of social, emotional, and academic development. Um, one of the specific words in here is this word of persons and not adults because as you'll see a little bit later on, we have a lot of students that serve as mentors as well for our younger students in our peer mentoring programs. Uh, so why mentoring? It sort of begins with supporting our Blueprint 2.0, our goal 2B with, to strengthen and expand our student support service efforts. Um, and then we're also here to support the school's climate goals. And the mentoring is number one focused in relationships. And this is a two-way relationship. We're asking the mentors and mentees to both have the expectations that they are both getting <laughs> something from this. And then one of them is not in charge of carrying the role of this relationship. They both have equal part in the say of what they do and how they do it. Um, and that's a big part of the relationship piece. Just to give you an idea of what my role is and how I support our mentoring programs, um, sort of going through various stages, I provide ongoing support for our school-based mentor coordinators, which I'll speak on in a few moments, uh, recruit and train and try to support our community-based mentors, coordinate our team BCPS mentoring programs, and then just engage support from local businesses and organizations for mentoring as well. Um, to give you a little bit of background, the position was first put into Baltimore County Schools in the 15-16 school year, so we're just completing our third year of the program. Um, and we've been very pleased with where we've come so far and, and we'll sort of uh, address where we're gonna go next year with our next steps. So what does mentoring look like in Baltimore County Public Schools? If you go into our schools, you're gonna see a lot of different programs. You're gonna see the traditional one-to-one -one mentoring. The, the Usually the first program that people's minds immediately jump to when they think of mentoring, the best example is Big Brother Big Sister. Oftentimes that's the most common form people refer to. We also have a lot of group mentoring happening at all levels, so elementary to high school. Some of our schools even like to implement a little bit of both. They like to have a group mentoring, but they like to also know that some of those students are getting supported in an extra one-on-one -on -one level. The difference really being is that in one-to-one, -one, you're getting a much more personal relationship building opportunity. In group mentoring, you get a little bit more of a sense of built in the community among the students and the mentors that are involved. And then we also have a lot of peer mentoring programs that are occurring within our buildings, typically our older st students serving our younger students. And this, this manifests itself in a variety of ways. We have it within individual buildings. Uh, best examples are 12th graders and 10th graders, 11th graders and 9th graders, because they can move on together. We have high school students and elementary students. We have elementary students, fourth and fifth graders, working with younger students in their buildings. So we see this in a lot of different varieties. Um, just to give you an idea of what our numbers look like as far as students that were impacted this year as mentees, um, this information comes from approximately 90 schools that were pr provided me with this data, and I sort of wanted to break it down for you between the levels so you would have an idea of what we have. Um, so we had, in elementary, we had about 50 schools that were running 79 programs. A lot of our schools run multiple programs depending on the needs and how they do it. Um, and then you can see those numbers again for the middle school and the high school. And so it was just a very good year. We had over 5,600 students impacted by mentoring, which is, which is very exciting, again, with only three years into this. So it was definitely very um, good to see what's coming ahead. Also on that um, slide, I just want to note that that's the information we have that they have sent to central office. So we would know that information because they're using extra duty um, activity funds to pay for someone who's leading the mentoring program. 
Um, and as far as our mentors, um, who they are this year, we sort of broke this down as uh, students that are mentors, adults that are serving as mentors, and then we started to look this year for the first time who are our non-BCPS mentors. To give you an idea who those people are, we see, have a lot of our local colleges and universities that have students that are helping um, mentor in our buildings. We have spouses of staff members. We have uh, family members, parents that are coming in. So we have a wide variety of the non-BCPS mentors that are coming in to support our school. And this year, and I'll touch on it again in a few moments, um, uh, we've really created a solid base to support these mentors. Instead of just saying, hey, come in and mentor, we wanted to provide them with resources ongoing so that they're able to maintain um, what's expected in the mentoring relationship. So touch again on the school-based mentor coordinator. This is an extra duty activity that was made available for schools last year, uh, much like that of a coach or um, perhaps a news cl newspaper club sort of leader. Uh, their roles and responsibilities are to coordinate their school-based mentoring programs. They oversee the matches between the mentors and mentees. They make sure they're consistently checking in. How's it going? Um, do you need any support? They can train and supervise the mentors that are in their building. They also maintain different data for our mentors and mentees, so we know what we have. Typically, how long are they meeting? How often are they meeting? Um, we know that in mentoring, one of the biggest factors is um, the relationship built over time. So we kind of, we, 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 it's important to know how often they should be meeting and, and what they're doing during those times. I also offer PD throughout the year for these school-based mentor coordinators, and this year we based it on the type of program they were offering. So I would run groups for, say, if you're running a one-on-one, -on -one, this way they can increase their collaboration collaboration and share their ideas with what they were doing with each other because last year when we first started a lot of people want to know what are other schools doing because they like to compare so this year we were able to uh, create a more collaborative space for those individuals just to give you an idea when I work with the school based mentor coordinator this is sort of the path that we follow if we they want to implement a new program or if they're starting from scratch in their building we always want to start with why why do we need to implement this mentoring program um, what is going to be the best model to facilitate it and how is it going to be structured I don't go from school to school and say this is how you need to do it because it may not fit what that school needs so it's very important that the schools have the flexibility to design the program based on their needs and their students as well and continuing with the why in the beginning of the year, in the fall, I asked my mentor coordinators to give me what it was that they were using to sort of pick their students for their programs. And you can see there's a variety of, of your typical data points. We have attendance, we have grades, we have office referrals. The highest number there is our school-based employee input. And what this tells us is that school staff members are getting together and they're saying, why does Marcus walk home alone every day? What staff member in this building is how they're really close to? How can we help address these students that seem to be lacking these relationships to therefore then support, well, we need to look at these office referrals. How can we tie that in? How can we tie in the grades? So I think it's really good to know that we are having very detailed conversations about our students and who they are and what they need. Um, I'd also really like to highlight our BCPS Central Office Employee Program. This began last year, and it's a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program. And last year, we started with a pilot in three of our high schools, and we worked with ninth grade males. The employees that we have that are doing this are typically central office employees that are going and mentoring these students during the day and spending that extra time with them. I won't say any names, but I believe there are four of them in this room right now that, are, <laughs> that take part in this program. This year, we doubled our schools, so we now have six schools participating. We onboarded a middle school, and we also had new ninth graders, and our mentors from last year, almost every single one of them went on and were still working with their mentor this year, so now they have a 10th grader. And we also had an opportunity to bring everybody together and celebrate the time, even with two snow days before the event, but we got the event together and it was, <laughs> it was a great moment for um, everyone to sort of be together and see that they're not the only one that is doing this. And it really was a, a wonderful event, so we look forward to doing those in the future. Um, continuing with our community-based mentors, we're, we're very uh, solid in the foundation, we feel, to start the active recruitment at a much more consistent level. This year we saw not only the website launch um, for the mentoring portion of our BCPS website, but we also were lucky to have approval for the BCPS Mentoring Handbook, which is available um, online for people that are interested. Um, a training has been developed by myself and a team of mentors that is culturally relevant and is based in the elements of effective practice for mentoring. Those are the national standards from nationalmentoring.org. So that work is put into research um, when we come in for that. Um, I just wanted to give you as well a screenshot of what the website would look like if people are coming to check out mentoring. I have some basic information on here for them, sort of descriptions, um, reasons why it works, and then what to do if they're interested in being a mentor. What's nice about that is there's a sheet on there that they can actually fill out, and as soon as they fill that out, I get an immediate notification that someone is interested and I'm able to come see where they're comfortable and what they would like to do with our, with our mentoring. 
one of the things that I try to do is to really let these people know, anyone that's interested, that the mentoring is not, you're not coming in and you have to come in and do this. I want to base a program around what you're comfortable with because I want you to be committed and I want you to be consistent and therefore I feel like you need to be comfortable. So if you want to come in and work with the group, come in and work with the group. If you want to commit to that one-on-one -on -one relationship, then understand what that's going to be asked of you. So we make sure we craft this program as to not limit the mentors and what they can and cannot do. Uh, as far as looking ahead for next year, we're going to put a real big effort into increasing our peer mentoring programs. We just see a lot of connections with these students and um, they really work really hard to maintain the relationships within the building and just improving the climate within individual buildings based on these peer mentoring programs. And then whatever their feeder school may be, they already have a relationship that they can look forward to as they move on. Uh, really important the active recruitment of the outside mentors to try to increase what we have with that because we now again have the solid foundation to bring them in and then continuing to spotlight the programs that our schools are doing. We have some really amazing things that are happening. Um, there's a lot going on on Twitter. They like to show what's happening and it's great to see these relationships. Uh, the final piece I wanted to share, um, we know the data is extremely important and sometimes the best data in my opinion is to see what students are saying and these are some actual um, reflections that were shared with me from some of my mentor coordinators and they just, I'll let you read them on your own, but they just, they really kind of show what's important for these students and how these people, how they're affected by their peer mentors. Uh, the one I do like to highlight is the one on the right. It, this is written by a third grader to a fifth grader. They're gonna be a sixth grader and an eighth grader together. They're gonna be a ninth grader and an 11th grader together. So they have an ongoing relationship that's always gonna be there. So we see the impact of this. So I thought it, this is important to share because our students are finding great value in, in what they're doing. And so with that, I'll just ask you if you have any questions or if you'd like any further details. <laughs> when does the actual mentoring take place? So that's, again, that's going to be a school-wide decision. So depending on the type of the program, for example, a one-on-one -on -one mentoring program, they may have it, okay, I'm going to check in with Miss Eaton at least every morning when she comes in, but every Friday we have a scheduled 30-minute session where we're meeting face-to-face. -face. Is that during school hours It or could be during school? the school hours. It could, our group programs are typically going to be after school. Mm -hmm. um, our uh, peer mentoring programs, we might typically have some high school students that finish earlier, especially if they have the proximity to come over geographically. Mm -hmm. I always use the example of Newtown where they have such great um, Newtown highs directly across the street from Newtown Elementary so the students could easily get there. Um, so it just depends on what schools want to do based upon their schedule and their availability. And some of the students are referred to a mentor. Can they decline? Absolutely. It's, it's one of the things we want the, to understand about mentoring is this is not um, a punishment. This is not something where you, we feel that you need this to, to fix an issue. It's, this is an offer of support and we're not gonna match someone that doesn't wanna be involved. And that's one of the reasons we continually check in with the mentors and mentees, because the worst thing that we can happen is have a mentoring relationship that's not working. So we do have processes in place to actually dissolve mentoring relationships because we need to end them rather than carry them on if both parties are willing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. um, <clears throat> There was a slide about um, the distribution of um, BCPS adult mentors and outside. Uh, the BCPS mentors, um, are they being pay all being paid for being mentors or how does that, uh, I know the mentor coordinator, I guess you mentioned the extra duty assignment or whatever. Yes. They're, I just want to understand who in BCPS gets paid for doing mentoring work and who's volunteer. So the extra, if, if the individual, the school-based individual is an extra duty activity, they will get paid because they've done their work outside of the school day to plan their programs or whatever else they have. The other people are volunteering during their time and making sure they are fixing out their time to make sure that whatever they use they're making up and so if they're in a building they know that they have to flex that time or make sure that it is taken care of at some point in time. So just the coordinator is the person yep. who gets the extra duty hour. All the other mentors are volunteers. And there are quite a few volunteers, correct? Yes. Okay. Yes, I, absolutely. And I was, you, you explained about Newtown. I was wondering how the high school to elementary kind of logistically worked. And when it's across the street, uh, is that the most common where there's, you know, physically located together or? Yeah, so typically if you have schools that have the proximity, that's where you're going to see more of that because it's just easier for them to get there. Mm -hmm. um, there are certain schools that have these peer programs where these high school students, they are getting into their cars at the end of the day and they are driving over to schools 
because they want to go and do this. That's so we do see that as, as well. Or I can share when I was a principal, um, the, the high school that wasn't that far away, their football team had a, um, a relationship, so they came over as a group and then worked with the students. Mm -hmm. Great. Mr. Young, you had a question or thought? Or? Okay, all right. Okay, I think, uh, thank you very much. That's very uh, interesting and uplifting. Supportive. And, yes. <laughs> uh, thank you both. Okay, moving on, I'd like to invite uh, Ms. Shea and Ms. Cohen forward. Um, we're um, going into our next section of the agenda where we're going to be reviewing instructional materials that will be coming forward to the boards in July, uh, July I believe. July or August. We're July waiting or for August. Yes, mm -hmm. In the summer. So these are some instructional materials we'd like to share with you so that you have an understanding of what they are, why, um, why they're important, and how they support our student learning. Good afternoon. Um, so last month we were here, we were showcasing all the incredible aspects of our music and dance program. Um, and I know those programs really speak for themselves. And we focused a lot on the performance aspects. So tonight we really want to talk about the instruction that happens before they get to those beautiful performances. Um, and so in the fall, the state of Maryland adopted a new set of the um, National Core Art Standards. And so as a result, it was um, necessary for us to revise curriculum. Um, and as part of that ongoing effort to um, revise curriculum in a way that's going to meet the needs of our students, um, we have identified the need to have resources. Um, music is an area that we have not centrally purchased textbooks in, I think it's safe to say, multiple decades. Mm -hmm. um, and so the um, we do have some individual schools as a new school opened. If the um, principal opening that school had funds within their new school budget, they sometimes purchased it. Um, but the state of the materials is um, not strong <laughs> and so this has been a long time coming but it actually works out well that it's coming at a time where we're also moving in with our new standards so it gave us an opportunity um, so we used the procedures outlined in 6002 um, and had um, several different stakeholders help us to select um, these resources that we will be bringing forward as um, Dr. McComa said um, music studio is a program that is um, truly blended in that there are class sets of printed textbooks books, um, but there are also, there <laughs> Vanna White over here is, <laughs> is showcasing them for you. Um, and then they also have um, digital materials that includes things like streaming audio and video, um, but also has interactive musical instruments. For um, Last time we were here, we showcased our student composer, and we also showcased some of our dig digital instrumental music. So this gives our elementary students an opportunity to start experimenting with some of those digital tools for the actual um, composition of music. Um, it also helps with our literacy focus, with understanding how to read music, um, and help develop that lifelong love of music and appreciation. Um, in particular, some of the um qualities of this particular resource that stakeholders um, commented on were the cultural um, diversity of the um, song selected, um, but also with the digital music, having that digital library um, to allow for more current um, musical selections, which I know my fifth grader would appreciate <laughs> um, for performances. So um, this is an opportunity for us to have authentic, um, culturally diverse music examples um, for the instruction and also for our students to have opportunities to explore um, digitally as well. And so with the goal of then, of course, thinking of last month's presentation, to have that curriculum in action where our students then are able to participate in those performances. And again, we know not every student is going to um, continue down a pathway in middle and high school um, with magnet programs where they're focused on this. But in elementary school, we really feel very strongly it's important for all students to have that access and opportunity to develop lifelong music, either from an appreciation standpoint as a member of the audience, um, or certainly to be able to perform and ultimately even compose. Did I miss anything? No. <laughs> okay, so that's um, essentially why we're here. And so I took all my time on Tuesday night. So tonight I'm going to be <laughs> super brief. But I wanted to give you an opportunity if you had any questions for either myself or Amy. Um, thank you. Um, a lot of things have changed, I guess, in education. Um, when you say the curriculum for choral music is, I think that's what you 
I mean. So music in elementary school is actually one of the special areas that all students participate in. Um, when they get into fourth and fifth grades, they participate in a chorus, mm -hmm. um, which is part of their performance expectations. But actually, um, our kinder, and in some cases, our pre-K students participate in music instruction. So it's a part of their weekly instruction. Each day, they go to a different special area. Um, and so they all have instruction in music. I guess I was trying to get a sense of what is changing and what's changed. You said there are new standards or we something? We do have new standards. And what, can you give me a, an example of something that's changing in terms of music education? That's what I... Absolutely. So I'm thinking of uh, Ryan's presentation as well as Jim and, and the maker movement and the focus on creativity and 21st century skills. And you see that clearly at our new arts standards um, with the connecting, the responding, and it's not just about the performance now. It's about the movement, understanding self and space along with music, playing other instruments, but cr that creativity of... What whether you're composing, you're writing a dance, you're responding to music, you're connecting music between cultures. Um, it's far different than when we went to school, um, and it's even quite different than it was 10 years ago. So these resources allow us to have common conversations across all of our elementary schools around the standards and how we can customize the songs and materials in just these anthologies, but then the wealth that's in the digital library as well to make it appropriate appropriate for each school. We know our schools differ greatly in what songs or musical examples will engage students, and this platform allows for that. What's in that book there? Pass it. Pass well, it. we'll have show and tell. <laughs> I I mean, so these are the these are the actual song anthologies that you may recall. This so we have simple songs in there where students will track along as they're <laughs> listening and see the words, hear pronunciation. What the the digital aspect does is it takes that as well and it can animate it. It can isolate it for, for uh, pronunciations. It can slow the tempo down. It can change the key for the students so they could sing higher or lower depending upon what they need in their school. It can add multiple layers of. Harmony Harmony. So it can do so much more than the records or the CDs that we once had, okay. which are no longer made by any of our textbook companies. <laughs> so it's a real shift for us, but something our teachers have been asking for since I arrived here three years ago. I had an opportunity. Well, before to, that, I'm sure. And probably long <laughs> before that, I had an opportunity to look through a survey that was done in, in 2012 where a teacher stated, I'm saving box tops so that I can purchase some texts and, and CDs next year. I think it's an incredible opportunity for us to impact so many students and so many teachers um, for a long time to come. Mm, sounds neat. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Emery? Go any, ahead. any other questions? So is this going to be a contract coming forward soon? Yes. yes. And do you know how much it will be? I do. Um, over the life of the contract, it's about $1.5 million. Um, the first purchase is um, the rollout involves intermediate <laughs> The I'm first, sorry. I know you sympathize. Um, the first rollout will be in grades three through five, um, and that um, there is a breakdown of actually the majority. I'm going to pull up my spreadsheet, but it's I think around five hundred thousand dollars is on the print materials, and then um, oh, it's right in front of me. So we have um, five hundred thousand dollars in teacher materials and two hundred twenty-five thousand dollars for the student, and that's for grades three, four, and five. Um, and then the following um, year, the rollout would be K1 and 2, and it would be, again, close to 500, just under $500,000 for teacher materials. And then by teacher materials, we're including the print um, because those are purchased as class sets, and then the 220000 So that's a little bit of a misnomer because the students will use the anthology, but in terms of the purchase, we're essentially talking about print versus digital. And and I'm, not, I'm not sure if it's coming in July or August, but the summer. And that's over how many years at 1.5? Six. Six, Six okay. years. Great. Or I guess the one will be over two years. But right. So the initial purchase would happen over two years, but the contract for the digital access would be for six years. Thank you. Mr. Young. Okay. So. Um, okay. Go oh, ahead. No. Go ahead. So the, based on the new standards, the focus is moving from just a performance base to, as you said, oh, learning gosh. more about music. Mm -hmm. And I think as I was looking through this, what I heard you say was, you know, with the digital aspect, students had a chance to have the opportunity to change the key, change mm -hmm. the yep. tempo. So mm -hmm. even taking the, the same song and changing what instruments mm -hmm. are playing it. Yes. 
Yes. And if you think about when we talk about our definition of literacy and we had our presentation about that, an aspect of literacy besides reading, writing, listening, and speaking is that critical thinking. So to your point, how does changing the key change the emotion or the mood of the music? Why might a composer have made that choice of that instrument? What are they trying to communicate? So using that music as a source, if you will, um, and developing those literacy skills in our students is much more a focus um, with the new standards. I would just like to add that you know when you when I really think about the sort of the significant difference here, uh, we, what we're seeing really um, is this movement towards empowering students to be creators mm -hmm. of music, right? As opposed to we learn how to play an instrument and we play someone else's song and we have to play someone else's song really well. To now, our students not only have to have the proficiency of playing an instrument and being able to play someone else's song, but they are empowered to generate their original song and to um, create and publish that. So I think that's sort of that, that, that taking it up a level, if you will. Mm -hmm. Bye. And I guess it also gives them broader exposure because whether you're on the orchestra side playing a cello, you can now hear that same song that a band person would play. Exactly. Yeah. Dr. McCose, <laughs> Dr. McComas, <laughs> should we be voting on our approval of the, uh, or how does well, that work? Right, so I think, you know, yes, if you approve these as instructional materials, because our, our role in this committee is about the instructional aspect, yes. and then you'll see the purchasing piece of that come forward uh, at a contracts committee and then right. to the full board. So yes, our, our purpose here is to seek approval for it to be instructional materials. Okay, mm -hmm. so I guess I would ask for a motion to move these forward no. for, you know, you know, I, mean, <laughs> you know, I can't imagine. Uh, yeah. They don't yeah. have any. <laughs> <laughs> right. Get back out the back box, box tops. Box. Right. <laughs> yes. Okay, yeah. Yeah, I think we're in agreement that we, we are approving these to move forward for the Thank you very, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. We do appreciate that. And we, and we do hope that um, we've done a good job of helping you understand what the materials are, how they fit in instructionally. <laughs> and, and it sounds like we haven't purchased any for quite a while. When I was looking um, in my role last year when I was working with the music office, um, at that point it looked like we had not purchased music textbooks since I think 1982. It was astounding. <laughs> I think what happens is people, you know, budget cycle after budget cycle, when you have to look at where you streamline, mm -hmm. you think, well, music, they don't really need textbooks. They're making music, but there are resources that teachers need. And again, I think Ms. Cohn really helped us, um, and Ms. Shea helped us understand how the nature of the materials are um, significantly different than they were several decades ago. And the materials today allow students uh, to learn in interactive ways uh, through digital resources that they weren't able to mm -hmm. even 10 years ago. So that's great. Thank you. Um, our next uh, presentation here on instructional materials is Mr. Imbriali and um, and Mr. Corns, I think, or is he just, he's handing off the materials. Okay. He's gonna sit down. And uh, what we're bringing forward here for your consideration is uh, robotics components and software um, for um, lots of different uh, curricular opportunities. So I'll turn it over. So I have slides again. Mm -hmm. So uh, as, um, as you heard, this is robotics components and software. There is a contract number related to that. It's LK0427-18, um, uh, and it's, uh, for example, we're passing right uh, around right now Lego Mindstorm EV3 as an example. Um, these are really, uh, the contract is about equipment that allows our students to design and engage in learning by both building something and then programming robot, robots. So it includes software that facilitates uh, computational thinking and the software is a part of the construction process and the components that you're seeing here. Um, so, uh, uh, this is used as a part of our instructional program, both through the work that you saw earlier through the presentation around uh, BCPS makes, and it's also an integral part of the curriculum at our two STEAM elementary magnet programs. So that's Cromwell Valley Elementary School and Chatsworth School. Both those schools have programs that relate directly to um, programming, constructing, designing, and they use uh, the Lego equipment like you're seeing here. 
It's also used in a, a number of our after school clubs, our first Lego league, our robotics clubs. Uh, and then um, these tools are used in all of our extended year programs that are, done, that are run through Title I at our elementary schools. So with that, I'll open it up to questions because it's really that simple. <laughs> <laughs> and this was a, um, a, a it was a competitive uh, bid process um, where we ended up going with um, uh, it was it's through a cooperative that we're purchasing this material if approved. And how much cost is involved with this? Uh, I believe it's three year nine month contract for two hundred and ten thousand dollars over the life of the contract. All right. Any other questions? Steam. I'm sorry. Steam, Steam program. Mm -hmm. Yeah, those are the two schools. Yeah. <clears throat> so in those in those two schools, these kits are um, an integral part of the actual curriculum uh, in the classrooms, because uh, those magnet programs are designed around um, uh, these Lego robotics kits. But the kits are used in. Um, many of our schools, elementary and middle school, through first league clubs, uh, through our robotics clubs after school, um, and then during the summer, these kits are actually part of instruction in our Title I summer programs. And through Very our, tactile, hands-on. And through our office, they're also part of the uh, Maker Lending Library, so we've used them in uh, direct curricular integration in other buildings as well. They, they, you know what, I believe they still are on the Mobile Innovation Lab, but it's actually a great example of once these kits are in all of our elementary schools, then they wouldn't need to be on the, on the lab. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts or questions? Uh, are we in agreement that we want to move this forward to the... Yes. <laughs> <laughs> all right. We're in agreement that we would... Uh, support the movement to okay. the full board. Okay, thank you. We appreciate the mm. having the robotics for the kids. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I'm sticking around, right? Oh yes, so uh, Mr. Morelli will now share with us um, bringing forward instructional materials for our STEM summer enrichment program. And this time I'm uh, joined by uh, Leanne Schubert, who's the Director of Educational Options. Good evening. Um, and actually I'm gonna let uh, Leanne present this. Okay. You want the clicker? I do. There you go. So I do not have any Play-Doh, and I do not have Makey Makey kits. But I will make a connection for you this evening. So um, I just want to familiarize um, and contextualize our STEM summer enrichment um, programs. So um, as you're aware, and we actually spoke about on Tuesday evening, um, this past fall, Baltimore County Public Schools would, was awarded a Magnet Schools Assistance Program grant from federal government. It's a $15 million grant with the with the uh, specific intent from the federal government to uh, use those funds as C to establish um, new magnet programs or significantly revised magnet programs within the school system. Um, we're thrilled at the opportunity to expand um, our magnet offerings for elementary, middle, and high school students. Um, so the grant application that was approved by the U.S. Department of Education has a very strong emphasis on partnerships in the five-year grant as we establish these magnet programs. So to that end, we are looking to establish um, middle school, or I'm sorry, summer STEM camps at four of our magnet schools. So those four specific schools are highlighted for you. Um, the camp will focus on incoming fifth graders at our elementary school and incoming sixth graders at our middle school. So that is at Woodmore Elementary, Middle River Middle, Windsor Mill Middle, and Golden Ring Middle. Um, and again, um, part of um, the work that the federal government will be looking at are these partnerships and those extended opportunities that we can provide with the seed money um, uh, that was awarded within the grant. So as a reminder, looking at the four schools that are specific to this STEM um, summer camp, Woodmore Elementary School, Middle River Middle School, and Windsor Mill Middle School, as it relates to these STEM summer camps, have a focus on international baccalaureate magnet programs. So each of them have a unique 
focus within that IB framework. We talked a little bit about that primary years program and that middle years program. Again, our students are still um, working within our BCPS curriculum, and IB allows our students to have that global perspective. But each of our IB schools also has a very specific focus for IB. For example, some of our schools have um, chosen to look at global communication skills. Some of our schools are looking with a very specific um, STEM focus for their IB program. And then Golden Ring Middle is the health science magnet program where all of our students will be looking at health sciences from a global perspective. Um, and again, those opportunities are providing pathways for multiple experiences at the high school level. So some of our students might choose to continue continue on in an IB program, some of our students might choose to continue on in a health sciences program, or they might pursue other opportunities, magnet and non-magnet. So what exactly is the STEM summer enrichment? So we do have a contract coming before um, you on July 10th um, related to the STEM summer enrichment camp. Um, again, with a strong partnership with um, Educate Operating Company. Sylvan Learning. Uh, this contract will allow us to offer two week long STEMer, STEM summer enrichment programs for our rising fifth graders at Woodmore Elementary and then our rising sixth graders at the three middle schools. And through a project-based learning approach, our students will explore topics such as, and here's our connection for the e evening, robotics <laughs> or coding, engineering, these types of topics, but as it connects to that IB or health science focus that is a part of their magnet school. Um, we will be working with our teachers in these summer programs. So um, Sylvan will provide professional development for our BCPS teachers who are teaching in those schools but then working in this two-week summer camp with us um, to build our teachers' capacity for that um, STEM integration and enrichment and how it connects to our BCPS curriculum and how we can actually provide more additional opportunities for our students in the summer. This work will start in year two of the grant, so it's, it's mid-June, so we'll be looking at these camps for um, the summer of 2019, and it will be for up to 100 students at, at each of these school sites. So this partnership and this contract, along with other partnerships that have been built into the grant, with entities such as the Baltimore County Department of Health and Human Services, Johns Hopkins Bayview, Towson University, just to name a few of those partnerships, really allow us to provide strong, enriching opportunities for our magnet students, allow them to make um, those STEM connections and provide unique and rigorous learning opportunities um, in the summer months. So with that, are there any questions? See. Thank you. Since it's a grant, it's no cost to the students? Correct. Okay. And um, is there a lottery? Because suppose there's more than 100 students that want to go. Yeah, so that's one of the things we will work through once this contract is put into place in terms of that student identification piece. Mm -hmm. um, we will, there is a lottery, pure lottery to get into these programs for students, um, and we'll flesh out the details in terms of that student enrollment. Okay, thank you. <laughs> and just to Miss uh, to Miss Eaton's point, uh, the the contract that comes before you in July, if approved this evening, it's a hundred percent grant funded. Mm -hmm. yeah, I guess I just to ask the committee, are you in favor of moving this forward? Uh, and <laughs> okay, yeah, we're well, unanimous, so we're going to support. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And then last but certainly not least, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Wistad and Ms. Ryder up to share with us um, supplementary instructional materials for students with cognitive disabilities. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Hi, thanks for having us. <laughs> We're very um, excited to have this opportunity to um, familiarize you with some of our supplementary instructional materials that we currently use and wish to continue to use for our students who have significant cognitive disabilities in BCPS. So I first start with the concept within um, the Individuals with Disabilities Education Act. Within IDEA, it's important to note that all of our students, including students with disabilities, have equal access to the general education curriculum. So I want you to kind of keep that in mind as we go throughout this presentation. 
Um, in you're very familiar that many of our students um, are participating in the College Career Readiness Standards, they're taught that, and also participate in the PARC assessment. Most of our students with disabilities also participate in the PARC assessment. We do have some students with disabilities who are identified through the IEP team process who participate in an alternate assessment, which is known as the Multi-State Alternate Assessment, or otherwise known as MSAA. For, so for students who participate in the MSAA, um, one of the criteria eligibilities is that they also have to participate in modified curriculum. So the curriculum is aligned to the college and career readiness standards, and here's gonna be a crash course in this, um, but it's what's called core content connectors. So core content connectors are aligned to the overall college and career readiness standards. So for example, um, some of our students in the college and career readiness standards might have to um, count to 100, um, with ones and tens. A scaffolded back or core content connector standard might be to rote count to 10. Or for some students, they might have to summarize an entire text. A scaffolded back or back mapped core content connector might be to identify characters or to identify the setting or to identify the main idea of a story. So it's scaffolded back for our students in a modified curriculum. Um, there are learning progressions that our students have to participate in. And on the icon on the right, that's really kind of the framework when we're looking at this for students with significant cognitive disabilities. We look at the curriculum, the instruction, and the assessment, but the base of that is really around cumulative competence. That's the framework for this entire process for, for our students with disabilities who are receiving modified curriculum through the IEP team process decision making. So for cumulative competence, we want to ensure that all of our curricular materials are, are designed to make sure that we are ensuring that our students have a viable means of communication. It can range for our students. Some of our students can be using pictures to communicate. Some of our students can be using what we call low-tech devices, might, might be pictures. Some of our students learn to sign. And then for some of our students, they are verbal, and some who also use communication devices. So there's a range of, of, um, of um, skills, and what we want to make sure that all of our students, though, have a way in which to communicate their wants and their needs. Um, we need to continue, though, to make sure that we're providing materials that are also aligned to the content core connectors, to those scaffolded aspects, again, which are aligned to the college career readiness standards. We also want to make sure that we are using um, curricular materials and supplemental materials that ensure that our students are engaged in the learning process, that they are active participants in learning. So just to kind of give you um, an idea of who the audience is, of our um, special education population, about 8% of our special education population are uh, students who have cognitive disabilities and some students with autism. Um, of the 8% of our total BCPS enrollment, about 1% of those of the students um, are, are participating in the MSAA. I think it was about 1,500 students who participated in that MSAA, the multi-state alternate assessment this past school year. Um, we do we do have many of our students who, through the IEP team process, receive their special education services in some of our regional programs. We have functional academic learning support programs. We have communication learning support programs. And then we have um, public separate day schools, such as Battle Monument, Main Choice, and Ridge Ruxton. So some of our students are receiving modified curriculum and through uh, supports and services in these regional programs that we have at the elementary, middle, and high and comprehensive schools, and in our public separate day schools. With this, it's been a strategic goal of ours and a priority of ours in the Office of Special Education to make sure that we are seeking to always increase the academic, the communication, and functional outcomes of our students with significant cognitive disabilities. And one way is by providing them with the specialized instruction and the supplemental materials that are research and evidence-based um, to support them so they always have that access to rigorous um, curriculum and that it's always aligned to the general education curriculum. It is our goal to make sure that our students are college career, but also community ready. Currently, um, our special education teachers, they are using supplemental materials that are aligned to our core curricular materials here within BCPS. Many of the materials that they are currently using for our students who have the modified curriculum are the materials to the left, attainment is the vendor. They have a lot of um, materials that are aligned to those core content connectors and of which they'll be assessed by on their multi-state alternate assessment. Um, and these are for students receiving that modified curriculum. So special education teachers have been current, are currently 
currently and have been using um, materials from this vendor. In order, though, to address the increased special education growth, we, we continue to expand in our programs and we expand in our special education enrollment in our separate public day schools. We want to make sure that we're continuing to provide the necessary materials for our, for our teachers. Um, special educators are masters at individualizing and personalizing curriculum, um, but we do recognize that that's workload for our teachers because they're required to many times adapt or modify materials on their own. So we want to make sure that we are also providing um, resources and supplementary materials to our teachers so that way they can support the students in the classroom and not have to adapt all the materials um, on an individual basis. Um, so again, we want to ensure that we are continuing to provide these evidence-based materials that are adapted. They're addressing content, but one critical aspect of these materials is that they also support the students for what we call real-world or real-life applications. So they can be successful not only in school, but also in their community and post-secondary after they um, leave the school. So in, a call, um, in accordance with policy 6002, we initiated the contract process, um, and we worked very closely with um, not only staff within CNI, um, we also worked closely with administrators, and we also worked closely with teachers. They were all a part of this process and reviewing the different materials that we'll be talking, uh, I'll be sharing with you. Um, they looked at various vendors and the selected supplemental materials that would be coming forth in a contract in July. I um, will be uh, materials from the attainment vendor and also materials from AbleNet Mathematics. So those were the two selected materials um, and they were, teachers were overwhelmingly positive um, about these materials and very excited especially about some of the components of these materials that we'll be going through. Um, it is a part of our strategic plan to make sure we are supporting all of our students. We will be utilizing grant funds. We receive funds from MSDE to um, align to different initiatives. So this will be one of our initiatives is to ensure that our teachers have the materials for our students. So for the elementary piece, there are um, a myriad of resources that are within a kit, and it's called the Core Curriculum Solution. You could also purchase some of the items at an individual level, or you can purchase them as an entire kit. There's multiple resources. They have Pathways to Literacy, Early Literacy Skills Builders, and Building with Stories. So those are three pieces of the larger kit. And with that, um, it's really working to make sure we are um, providing systematic instruction to teach phonemic awareness, to teach print, um, and this is all done with what we call least prompt strategies um, and just teachable objectives. The great part about this, though, too, is that it includes a lot of adapted text. So teachers don't have to create, recreate their own text, and many of the texts are similar to a lot of the stories that we have here within BCPS when we did the alignment with that piece. Um, it ranges because we have some students, again, who um, are not verbal. We have some students who are verbal, and we have some students who are learning how to use words and pictures. So there's a variety of texts that are, that are included to meet the varied needs of students throughout their elementary time. Um, there are also storybooks and manipulatives that are included in regards to the literature. There's evidence-based math materials as well. The focus for the math materials is all about early, nu early numeracy skills. And the one important piece in which we love about the attainment materials is it ties everything back to real world um, because it needs to be relative for our students. It needs to help them when they're in the community to have those functional um, and real world application and life skills for our students. Um, there are also science materials that are included, and these align to a lot of our current science units here within BCPS. It's the five senses, geology, or science. Um, there's a lot of texts that are also included that are also adapted, and it also, again, applies to the real-world application needs of our students. With the middle school materials, all of these uh, materials complement one another and they build upon one another. So these kind of build upon a lot of the resources that are used in the elementary uh, materials. They're evidence-based research materials um, and we have, again, the Early Literacy Skills Builder. You saw that in the elementary level. So we're still working with some of our students on print and on phonemic awareness and early foundational literacy skills, but then it also builds for students who are emerging readers as well. And what I like about this is that um, it really uses text that's also age appropriate, because sometimes it's hard to kind of adapt a text down without making it um, not necessarily appropriate or developmentally appropriate, so it's a really age appropriate uh, material for, for our students to have access to. 
with, um, they also have a lot of adapted literature. The math, again, um, it's focusing on the numeracy skills and we start to introduce more um, word problems and it's all connected to real life. So that way it applies um, to the students in the real world setting. More science and social studies is um, provided at the middle school level and it provides very interactive opportunities so that they are active participants in their learning. The high school. The high school, again, you'll see very familiar titles. It just builds upon um, a lot of the materials that the students were taught in the, early, um, in the elementary, in the middle. These are all aligned to what we talked about, those core content connectors, of which those are the standards for our students with cognitive disabilities and those who are receiving the modified curriculum. Um, variety of texts, they have fiction, nonfiction plays, poetry. There's adapted text, for example, one of the texts um, in our schools in high school is To Kill a Mockingbird. There's an adapted version of that so they still have access to the general education curriculum and text and materials that are developmentally and age appropriate for them but it's adapted at a level at which they can be independent level for the students. Um, we actually have introduced a lot with budgeting and with algebra. Um, so those are scaffolded skills for the students and really works on mathematical concepts for them. Um, in real world activities. That's kind of, I think, the separating piece for a lot of the materials within this. And it also focuses on the cumulative competence. They talk, um, they also introduce more to American and world history. There's a lot of very heavily um, illustrated simplified text for our students so they can still have access to that and practice their reading skills. With transition, this is one of my favorite parts of this, is we need to make sure that all of our students are prepared. We talked about college career, but also community ready. ready. Making sure that our students can be independent in the community and making sure that our students have employment opportunities. Um, when we're talking about transition, a huge piece of transition is really about um, social skills. It's how do you not necessarily have the employment skills, but how can you engage with others? How can you interact with others? So a huge part of the transition material that are utilized for our students focuses on social skills. They need to be able to have those appropriate skills to work with others, to respond to um, a boss, and they, they, we want to make sure that they have the skills before they leave. Um, before they leave high school. So a lot of this is on personal care for some of our students. We have to prepare them how to live on their own um, independently um, and also exploring your community, personal success, social skills, and community success. So this is very um, heavily, um, there's a lot of skills that are, re are really heavily incorporated in making sure that they're successful when they, when they leave school in whatever um, job that they take on um, or if some of them do move on to college. But this is also a huge priority area for our office. With AbleNet, this was another select of materials. The teachers loved this one and they were kind of excited um, to move forward and to get this into their hands. Um, this is just for the mathematics piece. Um, there are mathematics supplemental materials with the attainment vendor, but there's also additional materials that teachers can use as an option here. This one focuses a little bit more on the pre-algebra and the pre-geometry skills for some of our students, but again, we have to scaffold back for our students to what is um, appropriate at their instructional level on um, Again, looking at those core content connectors, it's all scaffolded back for them. So, so yeah. So any questions you have for those questions supplemental materials for students with cognitive disabilities? Questions. Um, I had a question. Um, in your presentation, you sometimes describe the students as ones with cognitive disabilities, mm -hmm. and then you would use significant cognitive. Could you? Um, elaborate on the the makeup of the students that are going to use these materials. Sure. Um, most of the students um, who are using these materials, they've been identified through the IEP team process and we look at disability codings. One of the codings that many of the students would have would be intellectual disability. And then also the team would have to make a decision, does the child also warrant modified curriculum? So they're looking at, does the student have a cognitive disability, an intellectual disability, um, and does the student require a modified curriculum? Those are the questions that they would have to ask through the IEP team process, and that has um, the school psychologist is really heavily involved um, in regards to the identification process. Right, and then there's two groups, right? So uh, Ms. Ryder was talking about how our functional academic learning support our FALS classes and our communication learning support, our CALS classes, some of them are within 
um, neighborhood schools. So those students may be higher functioning than those that are in our public separate day schools. So that's kind of the difference between the significant okay. cognitive disabilities and the cognitive disabilities that she was talking about. And then you uh, mentioned percentages of 8%, I think, of the special education population, right. and then 1% of our overall, is mm -hmm. that, are those the right numbers? Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, yeah one percent. Right, one percent is, of our total. yeah, mm -hmm. okay. it, receiving a certificate of attendance as compared to the other students that will get a diploma. Mm -hmm. Thank you, thank you. So okay. we should also vote on this whether we want to move. Uh, is there support from the committee to move this forward? Uh, yes. 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 So we have unanimous <laughs> support of this to move forward. And thank we you thank so you much. very much. Okay. Thank you. On that, that really concludes our agenda for this evening's uh, curriculum committee. Uh, there will be no curriculum committee of July, and then we will resume next year's cycle of curriculum committee as uh, in alignment with the calendar that was approved uh, earlier this evening for next year's schedule. So thank you so much for your service on the committee, and please enjoy your summer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.